So what a day this has been already. Um, so I, I have to be, be really, really transparent with you right now that during our worship set, um, man, Holy Spirit has had a deep conversation with me. And um, whew. Today, I don't get to preach from my notes. I get to preach from my heart. <clears throat> and I see Katie check her watch. <laughs> Start texting city kids. No, we will, this is Mother's Day. We will, we will try to wrap up and get to Applebee's before the Baptist. That will be our goal. Um, these songs that we sang this morning are so true in his goodness. And I think that we, a we statement, I think that we get so caught up in being Christians or doing Christian activity or trying to be examples or disciplining ourselves to read and mark the box that we did, I think we, we have this, this fragrance in the church that, that puts a greater emphasis on our doing than it is on His goodness. His goodness is confounding. There's no other... That was my wife's phone. Yeah, totally. Mm. There's no other relationship in our lives that begins like our relationship with Christ begins. Our relationship with Christ is so counterintuitive to every relationship that we have. If, if we're applying for work, we, we, we present our best resume, and we, we, we go to an interview, we present our best self, and both in attire and in attitude, and, and trying to learn uh, the, the environment that we're trying to get an employment in. If, if we're trying to build a personal relationship with, with someone in our lives, we, we, that, that first date, we, we put our best foot forward. We try to go to exercise to the, the best restaurant or, or, or what would, would be one of liking for the environment. And, 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 and during that for initial conversations, we, we try to be so unselfish and so engaging. And, and what's your story? And, 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 and how can I come alongside you? And, and every, every relationship in our life is so counterintuitive to our relationship with the goodness of God. Because the goodness of God starts like this. We come to him and say, hey, before we have this relationship, I need to tell you all my brokenness. Like before we can have a personal relationship, did you know what, what a horrible person I am? Did you know that I have these terrible thoughts? Are you aware that I have this addiction? And although I'm sitting here with you today telling you I have this addiction, I do plan on going back to it. And I know that I've hurt you a lot, but the odds are I'm going to hurt you again tomorrow. And I really would like to have a relationship with you, the kind of relationship where I can just set the rules and, and you'll have grace for me. There's no other relationship that starts like that except one that starts with the goodness of God. And the church, I think we've lost that message. No, I think that we've deferred that message. I think we've deferred the goodness of God and hoping that our, our, our educational institution will might communicate it. And so when they don't, we get angry. I think that we've deferred it to Hollywood and hope that the, 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 the entertainment industry will perhaps communicate the message and when it doesn't, we get angry. I think that we defer it to who would be our favorite politician and that hopefully they will display the message of the church and when they don't, we get angry. And I think there has to come a season where the church has to stop deferring its message and start being its message. And his message is, he's really good. He's really good. 
And I just sense in my spirit that there's, there's perhaps people in this room that you doubt that. You don't mean to. You just wonder. Like, if you knew the circumstances of my life, would you really be able to say he's good? The way I can tell it's just the Holy Spirit is because I never bring bottles of water with me. And today we're going to need a bunch. I'm going to land a little bit on mothers to, to continue this message because Mother's Day is today and it's appropriate, but I hope we can look beyond just the gender-specific message and just see what the, the bride of Christ is supposed to be. Mothers, everywhere in, the, in Scripture, wherever in Scripture there's a, there's a significant story of a female if, if, if I want to challenge you to every time you read scripture when there's a significant story of a female, if you would start reading it through the lens of that, that female is, is a metaphor, it's symbolic, it's, it's an illustration of the church. It's the bride. Every, every significant story of a female in scripture is, is, is emblematic of the bride. The, the, the bride, I don't know if you look around you, but the bride isn't gender specific. But the bride, the mother, in the kingdom has an authority. It's, it's quite compelling. When Jesus, Jesus, the, the Bible says on the third day, Jesus went to a wedding. I can think of another third day where there was a wedding, but we'll land on this one. And he went to a wedding, and it says that his mom and his disciples were there. And the wedding host says they ran out of wine. So Jesus' mom says, son, make some wine. And Jesus, I, I read it several times recently even, it's interesting that it's on my heart today. Jesus' response starts with, woman, let me tell you what, husbands, you need to be Jesus before you address your mother like that. Woman, it's not my time. That's his line. It's not my time. She doesn't even respond to his response. She simply turns to his disciples and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Now Jesus is in a quandary, is he not? It's like, mom, mom. Everywhere we go, you, why? So he does what we call the first recorded miracle. I believe there were more miracles that aren't recorded because how did Jesus' mom know he could do one? This is the first recorded miracle. And so he turns water into wine, and it's the best wine they've ever test, tasted. And by the way, this story is not just a, a, a wedding that did happen. This story is a prophetic story for the future of Israel to see that the wine of Holy Spirit has arrived. And he brings a better wine than they've had before. He brings a fresh wine that didn't exist before. He brings something new that they've heard of but haven't tasted. And he makes wine. Moms can move the hands of time in heaven. He said, it's not my time. Yet the bride moved him to a miracle. We have that in this room. All through Scripture, we would, we would see this today. That for, those, for, the, for those of you that would, would say, look, when we go to church, if we don't open the Bible, it's not church. We'll get there, okay? Just hang on. In Scripture, there's a story in the Old Testament of this woman named Gomer. And this prophet named Hosea was told by God to marry Gomer, and Gomer was a prostitute. She was a woman of the street. And he married Gomer and brought her to his house, and, and, and she went back to her old life. And Gomer, Hosea was upset, and God said, go get her. So Hosea went and got Gomer. He brought her back. 
Three times. Three times this, this woman leaves her husband to go back to her former life. Can I tell you that the picture of the bride, Christ, the good news is we'll never give up on the bride. No matter how often we go back, he will send a messenger to rescue the bride. He loves the bride. And his goodness should be on display in the bride. And his goodness gets lost when we start marginalizing people and holding grudges and doing more than just loving. Can I tell you that the people in your life that you currently disagree with, you have more in common with them than you don't? Gomer, Gomer's a great picture of, of how he'll never give up on the bride. Sarah, Abraham's wife, was barren. She couldn't have children. <clears throat> but she ended up having a child. He says, listen to me, the church should be the place of new life. But not just new life, miracles of new life. Aren't you hungry for miracles? Is it, is it just me, or, or, or are we hungry for healings, and breakthrough in relationships, and fresh vision, and hope restored, destiny revealed, joy expressed? It, 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 can we just get hungry? To give birth to something we've not given birth to? Sarah's a, a great picture, a picture of the bride. Gomer's a great picture of, of the bride. Referred to her earlier, the, the, the mother of Jesus. Through the bride, there needs to be a revealing of Holy Spirit. Here's, here's where I'm going with that. When Jesus was on the cross, there's so much in my head. When Jesus was on the cross, he looked down and it says that his mother was at the foot of the cross. And he called John, his disciple, over. And he said to his disciple, what did he say to him? Comfort her. It was a foreshadow of Holy Spirit being released for the bride, our comfort earth. That he'll, he'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll give us. He'll give us the wisdom that the enemy might never have an advantage, the Bible says. But his mom had to do something. She had to receive the gift of the comforter. She had to permit the comforter to influence her life. Man, the woman at the well. Remember the story of the woman at the well, Samaritan? In, in, in antiquity, that was, she was not Samaritan, nor Jewish, nor Greek, nor Hebrew. They, they were, it's kind of a mix. Half breed. Scripture tells us that Samaritans were treated like dogs. They're always the example, even in Jesus' parables, of, of the least likely. And, and it says he had to walk through, he had to walk through Samaria. It, it says that he had to walk through Samaria. He didn't have to, there was other paths, but he had to because he had an appointment with this woman at the well at, in, in the middle of the day. In the middle of the day. She shows up with her water bucket to get water in the middle of the day. It's the heat of the day. You get water in the morning, and you don't go to the well 
by yourself because the shepherds would harass the women that would come to get water. So the women would go in groups so that the shepherds couldn't harass them. And then they would also, in groups, most wells, we don't, weren't the kind of well that we picture today with a winding and you put the bucket down and wind it back up. Most wells were, were flat, were surface, and, and so there was large stones moved over them to keep livestock from poisoning them. So it, 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 it's counterintuitive that, that one woman by herself, middle of the day, going to a well to move a rock, perhaps harassed by shepherds. And there's this guy, Jesus. And he starts talking to her, and she did what the church is really good at. Jesus says, do you know who I am if I gave you living water? And she says, oh, wait, what's the right way to worship? Who's got it right? Do those people that jump around have it right? Or the people that just stand still have it right? What about the monks? They're playing music. Do they got it right? Well, I don't want to talk about what's wrong in my life. I want to talk about who's got it right. And he says, no, we're not going to do that. I want to talk about you. I'm not going to let you deflect because I love you, and I want to talk about you. And he said, go, go, go get your husband. And she said, well, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a husband. And he's like, you're right, you don't. You've had other husbands, and the man you're currently living with isn't your husband, so you're right, you don't, but go get him. <laughs> and I love her response. She says, it says, she perceived him to be a prophet. Probably. And it says that she went back to the city, and she said, I need you to come meet the man that told me everything I've ever done. Would you want that? Let's think about that. Let's think about that. Paul, I want to introduce you to a dude that's going to tell you everything I've ever done and everything you've ever done. This is super cool. He brought this message. It said, come meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. In other words, come meet the man for the first time in my life didn't judge me didn't manipulate me, didn't gossip about me, didn't throw me under the bus. Come, come meet, because the bride has a message. And we need you to come meet the man who knows everything about you and invites you to drink living water anyway. You might want to text city kids. If you need a Bible verse, let me read to you. Or you, if you have a copy of God's Word, you can open it up to Genesis 17. I want to read this storyline, and then we're going to take it apart, and then we're going to bless our mothers. And then I'm going to go back and watch this and see if it makes sense. Genesis 17, when Abraham was 99 years old, <clears throat> when Abraham was 99 years old, can I tell you that in the kingdom of God, age has no influence? Ask this 99-year-old, or ask the little boy who had lunch that fed 5,000. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. <clears throat> I want to take a little shadow off of that too. He noticed he didn't say serve me faithfully and live a perfect life. He said serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. We're not called to be perfect. There's only one. We are called to be blameless, and that's about motive. I tell our staff as your lead pastor, there will be times you will, you will question my decisions, but you will never have to question my motive. That's blamelessness. He says to Abram, be faithful and blameless. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. And 99 years old, has no children. 
I'm going to make a covenant with you. Let me land that word covenant for just a moment. I know that I've talked about it before, but it's so pivotal in our Christian walk. That word covenant is, is, is a fixed position. It, it, nothing changes that fixed position. It's fixed. It doesn't change. And, and when he makes a covenant, a covenant is not a contract. Because in a contract, there's clauses that say, if you don't, then I get to do something to you. If you don't keep your end of the deal, there's, I, there's, I get to get retribution for you. That's a contract. A contract says, if you don't keep up your end, I cannot have to keep up my end. That's a contract. He didn't make a contract with this. He made a covenant. And a covenant says, this is, my, this is how I'm going to behave, whether you receive it or not. No matter how you view it, I will always do this. You will be able to count on this. This is who I am. I will never change from this. He made a covenant with you and I on the cross. His covenant is he will forgive every sin, past, present, future. His covenant is he'll never turn from us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. His covenant is no matter how you respond to his covenant, his covenant still stands. It doesn't get stained. And he says to Abraham, all I need you to do is be blameless, and I'm going to make a covenant with you to give you more descendants than you can count. At this, <clears throat> Abram fell on his face. That had to hurt. Then God said to him, this is my covenant that I will make you the father of multitudes of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Somebody needs to hear this today. Somebody here is walking without hope, and you need to hear this today. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants, those after you from generation to generation, this is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants. When we read that, that sounds so good. <laughs> so good. It's really nice. Let me give you a little history on that. We back up before this conversation between God and Abram and, and, and we're introduced to a guy named Noah. Noah, if you remember, Noah was told to build a boat. We miss so much in that story. Noah is told, I need you to build a boat because it's going to rain. Up to this point, the earth had never experienced rain. The water came from beneath. There had never been rain. God says to Noah, build a boat. It's going to rain. Noah's like, what is rain? God is like, build a boat or you're going to learn to tread water too. So he builds a boat. And as he's building the boat, God says, by the way, here's who's going with you. Two of every animal and your family. Can you, can you imagine being on a boat with just your family? for 80 days. What? I don't think the animals were there to be preserved. I think they were there to be a distraction. <laughs> so Noah builds the ark and, and, and the story happens, the rains come, the, the floods happen, the, the whole planet is flooded. It's a scientific fact that it all used to be underwater. That we can debate that at another day. Then, then the, the water subsides, and, and, and they, they, although it was 40 days that, it was in the, that we hear about the rain, they spent about 80 days in the boat from the time they got in the boat to the time that the rains came until the time they got out of the boat. It was about 80 days. It's kind of hit and miss. Some may say 100 and some may say a little less, but we're in the neighborhood of 80 days on this boat with family and animals and finally the boat lands and they're able to leave the boat and we find Noah gets drunk and naked. I don't know that I blame him. He's in his tent 
passed out, drunk, and naked. And he's got three sons, and one of them is named Ham. And Ham walks in the tent and sees his dad drunk and naked. And he goes out to his two brothers, and he starts mocking his dad. You got to see the old man. He drunk, passed out, naked. Tick-tock. We're going to get some clicks on this bad boy. No other boat builder. His brothers go in, but they go in walking backwards each side, carrying a blanket, not looking at their father and covering, covering the father. Noah wakes up, and you can tell that the Bible is written by men because we don't know the details. Somehow Noah finds out that Ham did this. And he has a conversation with Ham. He says, you, you, you mocked me. And because you mocked the father, your inheritance is a place called Canaan. And I'm going to curse Canaan. Your generations will be cursed. The fruit of the land will be cursed. Your health will be cursed, Ham. We catch up to where we read a few minutes ago in Genesis 17, and we see that God and, and Abram having this conversation. And just before that, God says to Abram, I have a promised land for you. Abram's like, yes, yes. God's like, you're going to love this place. Oh, I'm sure. I can't wait. Have we not had these conversations with God? I got a little surprise for you. And doesn't come out like we thought it would. Abram, I got this piece of land, and you're going to love it. It's going to be super cool when you go there. Where is it? Just trust me. I'm not going to tell you now. Just trust me. Really cool place. Follow me. You're going to have lots of kids, and you're going to have this really cool piece of land. So Abram does. Leaves, takes his flocks, just trusts. God tells him, oh, you're getting there. You're getting there. Here it comes. Abram's like, uh, what I see in front of me <laughs> is Canaan. And that place is cursed. God has this conversation with Abram that says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to redeem everything about you. And I'm so good, I'm going to use you to be a redeemer. You're going to redeem Canaan, so I'm not just going to change your name, Abram. I'm going to amend your name, and you will be Abram. Ham. There's nothing in your future that he doesn't want to redeem. He wants to call you Abra. To the moms, basically, I'm going to stick with a little bit of the notes. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> to the moms, to those who gave birth this year to your first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things, 
We don't mean to make it harder. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, spiritual moms, we need you. Those who have warm, close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge that experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you long for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you in these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. Moms are the bride. David, come up here. And the bride has a message. His message to us as the bride is, he will never give up on us. No matter where you are in your life, decisions of your own, or life has just caused you to wander off, he will never give up on you. To us, he says to the bride, you are full of miracles. I want to see them expressed. The only way that we stop miracles, listen to me for a moment, the only way that we prevent miracles is to stop believing for them. He's a miracle-working God. That's who he is. He can't help himself. He has to create miracles. And the only preventative is we stop asking. He's the God of fresh life where you don't think there's any today. And he's the God who restores and I have to believe that this stirring in my heart, if you're here very long, you know this is rare. Our staff will tell you I'm very deliberate about Sunday mornings and very calculated and very dialed in. And this is way out of my comfort zone. But for him to stir me like this tells me that someone in this room in your current darkness there is hope. In your current sense of loss, there is fulfillment. In your current sense of never measuring up, you are accepted. In your current sense of never being perfect, you don't have to be. In your current sense of being completely broken, he wants to heal. In your current sense of 
this series we've been on, trying to forgive, you can't do it on your own. You need him. I want to tell you today that he's, he's here right now. I need our prayer team to come up and get ready, please. I need everyone that's ready for prayer, please come forward. For the rest of you, stand. We stand for a moment if you're able. If you're not, that's fine. Can we spread out a little bit? We're a little. I can get I can get finite and detailed on what we're going to do next, but I, I I think it's obvious. You're here today. You're just you're just heavy stuff. Lots of hope, depressed. Feel like you're a failure. Any, any of that weird heaviness. Fear of the future. Can I, can I tell you that today, he says to you, this is my covenant to you. I call you Abraham. I call you band is going to take us for a moment and then Pastor Katie will come up and dismiss us between there here and there can we just pray and I believe that some of you need to to take a step you need to go you know this is the last day I'm going to feel like this and I need someone to just agree with me and maybe you can't even verbalize what you need you just come up and stand in front of Bonnie and just stare at her that's fine All you're saying is, Today's, today I need hope restored. Today I need to be called Abraham. Today, today I can't go another minute without hope. I can't beat myself up one more time. I can't live this defeated imposter mentality one more day. As the band takes us, will you respond to Holy Spirit?